bless you. We give you and glory for another time, Lord, to be taught by our teacher. We thank you for this great opportunity for us to be prepared for the assignment you have for her us ahead. We commit this class onto your hands and we pray that through your, te- your, your, your servant, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would speak through her to instruct us and to equip us, Lord, in the knowledge of your word concerning the things that John wrote years ago, bring it to our understanding and help us, Lord, to be practitioners of your truth and to be communicators of your truth to those, O Lord, who, Lord, you will send us to, to teach and build them in the word of your truth. Thanks be to your name, O Lord, for in Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. Thank you so much. Um, just give me a moment to get my settings right, and um, we'll begin. We would today be covering John chapter 6 and 7. Um, yes. Yeah, so uh, we'll start off with John chapter 6. Uh, you know, I will ask you to read a few verses, and then we would try to... Um, reflect on what is mentioned in those verses. And, um, you know, please uh, just go ahead and immediately start to read uh, instead of, you know, waiting a long while so that hopefully we can fit in a few more details, uh, you know, into the two hours that we have. There's a lot of um, things mentioned here in these two chapters, and it will be impossible for us to, you know, cover it, uh, all of it, uh, but we will really try to uh, fit in as much as possible. So we'll get started with uh, John chapter 6, verses 1, 2, 3, maybe. Yeah. So if we could have one person, please read out verses 1, 2, and 3. After this thing, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him, because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were with him. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Yes. Over here it talks about how there are large crowds following him. And uh, it also says that Jesus goes up on the mountainside and sits down there with his disciples. We don't get much background information from this, uh, from these verses. Uh, but then we have the parallel passage in Luke chapter 9, verses 10 to 11. And there we get a better idea of what exactly is the setting, uh, what was the occasion, and uh, uh, how were these you know large clouds um, large crowds being over here how were they um, impacting the entire situation so if we could have one person quickly go to luke chapter 9 and if we could read out verses 10 and 11 please that will help us gain a better background Could someone read out from Luke chapter 9, verses 10 and 11, please? I'll read. Um, and the apostles, when they had returned, told him that they uh, told him all that they had done. Then he took them and went aside privately into the into a deserted place, belonging to the city called Bethsaida. But when the multitudes knew it, they followed him. And he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who had need of healing. Yeah, so here we get to know that uh, this was the occasion when the apostles return back after their first ministry trip. Um, so they come back to Jesus very excited and they say, Lord, even the demons are submitting to your name. And um, uh, so they would have spent a long time, you know, moving from uh, place to place. So they probably would have been tired, exhausted. So now Jesus wants to take them away so that just 
they you know as a small unit they can spend some personal time together and uh, maybe even reflect upon all the ministry um, experiences that uh, the team has had uh, so jesus takes them aside for some alone time and uh, the crowd which gets to know about where they are located immediately follows so uh, this is the occasion that we are dealing with in john chapter 6 so the crowds have followed them to this place where he where Jesus had hoped to get some time with his disciples, but now the crowds have followed them there, and uh, Jesus graciously begins to minister to them. And there's a uh, word of explanation given here in uh, verse 4. Uh, if we could have someone just read out that one little phrase in verse 4, please. I'll read. The time for the Passover festival was near. Exactly. So the Passover festival was uh, very close. And so this is probably the large crowds which have come for the uh, festival, you know, uh, to Jerusalem. So probably there were larger numbers, you know, um, right now in this entire region, because people have come in from different places uh, for the Pastor Passover feast. And uh, so they would have heard about this Jesus and the um, extraordinary things that he is doing. And they would have heard rumors that he is the expected Messiah. So they come eagerly to him and Jesus uh, does not turn them away. And uh, so he ministers to them. And then, um, you know, as we know, uh, uh, it's ki kind of late in the day and uh, they, the crowd would probably be hungry. And that is when uh, we come to the next phase of this particular passage, uh, which would be verses 5 to uh, 7. If someone could read out, please. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming towards him. He said to the, where shall we buy bread that this may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. Right. So um, now one explanation that we could give for this uh, is that Jesus deliberately picks on uh, Philip um, because Philip was from this region. Uh, we get this information from John chapter 1, verse 44, where we learn that Philip, Andrew, and Peter are from this town of Bethsaida. So right now, they are somewhere in, on the outskirts of Bethsaida. Uh, Jesus had taken them over there, hoping to spend some time with them. Uh, so um, Philip and Andrew and Peter would be familiar with this uh, area. And uh, so in a way, we could say Jesus is asking for information uh, as to where they can buy bread uh, for, for these people. But of course, we learn from verse 6 that he has something more in mind. He is actually testing uh, Philip. So why would he test Philip? Um, why is he uh, very deliberately asking him this rather um, impossible question? Because obviously, uh, it would be impossible for Philip to produce that much food, right? But why? Why does Jesus ask him this question? Again, going back to uh, the context, you know, because now we know why these uh, disciples have come and gathered over here, uh, why Jesus has taken them to this place. So based on that, looking at that background, um, we could maybe uh, try to uh, guess uh, why uh, Jesus poses this question. So just going back very quickly once again to Luke chapter 9, uh, if we could look at verses 3 to 5, if we could have one person read out, please. Luke 9, 3 to 5. Luke chapter 9, verses 3 to 5. I read. Yes. And he said to them, Take nothing for your journey. No staff, no bag, no bread, no money, and do not have two tunics. And whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. And wherever they do not receive you, do not leave that town, shake off. Shake off the dust from your feet 
as a testimony against them. So on this mission trip, which Jesus had sent them out on, uh, we see that the instructions were don't carry, you know, um, um, extra clothing with you and don't take money with you. Don't take bread with you because this is going to be a literally a faith mission uh, where they would be completely relying upon the Lord to provide people who will have open hearts, who will have generous hearts and would be willing to help them, accommodate them, provide for their needs. So um, uh, they have just learned a lesson as you know, when they went out on this trip uh, on how to look to the Lord for uh, provision, for extraordinary provision, because uh, uh, they would probably have gone to places where the people would not have been very open to them because uh, Jesus warns them of that. He says they would be places where people would not be willing to welcome them. And he says, that's totally all right. If they don't accept you, just shake off the dust um, from that place uh, of your feet and move on to the next place because God knows, I mean, who will respond and who will not. Uh, so uh, they are aware of these things. So there would have been occasions where uh, God would have provided for them in an extraordinary manner. So. With that background in mind, when we look at this passage where Jesus is now asking Philip, uh, how are we going to feed these people? Uh, Philip probably should have spoken up with greater confidence and said, Lord, on the mission trip, we had all these experiences God provided. So I'm sure even now the Lord would provide. You know, he probably should have said something like that. Um, but uh, Philip is still thinking in the natural. He has not quite absorbed the les lessons learned in the recent uh, mission trip. And uh, so he replies as he does. Um, he says that even a, uh, even half a year's wages would not be enough to buy uh, bread for each person. And um, uh, also there's another uh, thing which probably these disciples should have kept in mind uh, because now they have been spending time with Jesus and he's probably been training them in the word of God uh, because all of them might not have been very familiar with their Old Testament. Uh, but now under Jesus, uh, you know, teaching, they, I'm sure, would have come up to speed. They would now know their Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, we have a parallel passage we could call it where we have an almost in a uh, similar incident taking place that would be in our second kings uh, chapter 4 uh, verses 42 to 44 where you have uh, elisha uh, taking 20 loaves of barley bread and he um, distributes it among a hundred persons and uh, the food automatically multiplies and it is those 20 loaves are sufficient for a hundred persons so jesus just not uh, does not just randomly ask this question he has given them uh, examples from the word of god probably uh, you know uh, regarding these things of what god can do and he's also given them some experiential uh, you know knowledge because now they have gone out on a mission trip without money or bread and they have come back all alive and well and rejoicing which means god has been providing for them in a very wonderful way uh, but they have not yet um, connected those things to this current situation. They have not yet uh, made that connection of faith. And so uh, we have Philip and also uh, Andrew uh, speaking in a rather um, in negative manner uh, because uh, Andrew speaks up in the next verse. Uh, if we could have someone read out verses 8 and 9, please. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was yeah, much bread. We'll, uh, we'll get to that a uh, little later. Uh, over here we have Andrew saying, How far will they go among so many? You know, I mean, there's just a few loaves of bread. Uh, it'll probably not, uh, you know, be enough for everyone. And uh, so both of them um, answer in the negative uh, simply because they have not yet learned the lessons of faith which Jesus has been conveying to them. So what can we learn for ourselves from this? First of all, God reveals to us from his word what we can expect from him. 
uh, what we can very trustingly go to him in prayer and ask for. So he has revealed that to us in the scriptures. And also, we would have had one or two experiences, or maybe you know, far more, uh, in our own past, where we have seen God providing, where, have, where we have seen him taking care. And he expects us to apply these biblical examples and our own experiences to our current situation. So whenever we find ourselves in a kind of uh, impossible situation, because of course, in the natural, just like Philip and Andrew were pointing out, in the natural, this was an impossible situation. There's no way that uh, five loaves of bread would be enough for uh, 5,000 people. Uh, but they were expected to apply whatever they have learned from scripture to the current situation. They were also expected to apply whatever they have learned from their personal experience to this situation. And they failed to do that. Uh, so we can learn from their mistakes. And when we are faced with an impossibility, we can look back to scripture and ask ourselves, uh, in scripture, when impossible situations came up, how did the people of God handle them? And what did God do? What did he reveal about himself in those situations is one thing that we can ask ourselves. And then looking back um, you know, closer in time to our own lifetime and what we have experienced uh, from the Lord in the past, we can ask ourselves, he did this for me on so and so occasion when things were looking rather tight. And on this other occasion, this is how he came through for me. So based on that, what should be my response to this current situation? So these are some lessons of faith uh, that we can learn for our own lives, um, you know, based on this first portion of the story. Now we would go into uh, verses 12 and 13. Uh, if we could have maybe someone read out 12 and 13. I'll read. Yes, please. When they were all full, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces of leftovers, let us not waste any. So they gathered them all up and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of leftovers from the five barley loaves which the people had eaten. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So uh, we see that there's not only enough for the people to eat, but they still have a lot of extra food still left. Uh, so even as they placed this bread in front of each group, you know, because the people sat down in groups and they, uh, you know, uh, set food in front of them, uh, the people ate all that they wanted. And uh, there's still a lot of uh, food which is left over. Why? Where was the need for this surplus? Uh, it says in verse 13 uh, that they filled up 12 baskets, you know, so you have still 12 baskets uh, filled with food, which they have not yet consumed. So why this huge surplus? I think God was just trying to show uh, his um, character. Uh, when he provides, how does he provide? He provides generously. It's never in a miserly way. It's never grudgingly. Uh, so when God works in an impossible situation, uh, it will not be just enough for us to survive and scrape through when he works in our impossibilities he will work in our impossibilities in a lavish way in a very generous way uh, we see that over here and another thing that maybe we could um, you know learn from this um, proverbs 11 24 where it says um, there is one who scatters yet increases more um, and there is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. So here we have uh, an example of a child who was willing to, you know, forego his five uh, loaves, and um, uh, he gave his all, whatever little bit he had with him, he gave it all, and it led to a very great increase. Uh, so maybe one thing that we can learn from this is that. Uh, whatever we are doing for the Lord, whether you know it is in our office place or whether it is among our, our relatives and friends, whatever little we are, that we are trying to do for the Lord in these uh, circles, maybe if we are very generous with our efforts, uh, the results that we see, the divine results that we see would be very large and great in number, you know, rather than if we were to just put in a little bit of 
effort, just sparingly just do a little bit of something and leave it at that, then maybe the results that we see would not be as grand and as big. Uh, so that maybe that could be another lesson that we could draw uh, from this particular passage. Moving on, um, uh, if uh, someone could read out for us verse 14. Yes, please, 14. And I'll read. Seeing this miracle that Jesus had performed, the people there said, "Surely, this is the prophet who has come into this into the world." Why would these uh, people, um, you know, connect what has just happened now with uh, the prophet that Moses talked about? Uh, there seems to be no immediate connection, you know, when we just, um, you know, when we just think about it. Uh, so that is because of, um, you know, Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 18, which we have already read in one of our previous classes, where Moses makes the promise that I will raise up a prophet uh, like me from your midst, uh, and you you must, you know, listen to him. That's what uh, Moses advises them regarding this prophet who will come in the future, and then. The connection over here is that Moses was the person who was providing them manna in the wilderness. And now here we seem to be having another prophet like Moses, and he is also providing bread. Uh, so uh, most probably when uh, I mean, after seeing this particular sign, because it says so in this verse, it says after the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they make the connection. They think about it. Moses, our prophet, provided manna in the wilderness. And now here is another prophet who is also providing bread. So is this also a direct sign, a direct indicator that this is the Messiah that we have all been waiting for? So in fact, um, you know, one of the signs, one of the indicators of the Messiah having arrived is um, demonstrated through this particular uh, miracle that God uh, that you know God performs over here. And yes, there was a hand that was raised, you know, just now, and I could not ca catch the name. If that person can, you know, present their question. No? All right, we'll move on. Uh, let's get into verse 15. Uh, yeah, if one of us could read out verse 15, please. <laughs> Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself and left. Yes. Uh, Jesus perceived that they wanted to make him king by force. At the moment, uh, Jesus ha has not come to become king. Rather, he has come to become a sacrifice. He's come to become a lamb, the lamb of God. Uh, so right now, uh, in God's timeline, he is meant to be uh, fulfilling certain other tasks. Uh, kingship, of course, would be coming later. Uh, but right now, this is not the timing for this. So Jesus withdraws from them uh, because he notices that they are determined to literally forcibly put him on a throne uh, so that he can liberate them from Roman oppression. So again and again, even as we are looking at all the four Gospels, we see that the people really thought the time had arrived for political deliverance. Um, not many were keen on spiritual matters, spiritual deliverance, spiritual rebirth. They were, their interest was not so much along those lines. And in fact, even here, you know, in this chapter, if we, you know, even as we go further, we will see that their primary interest was in bread, blessings, material things. Um, and it's only a handful who were really showing a deeper interest in spiritual things. Um, so they wanted a different kind of Messiah. Uh, but then Jesus was presenting himself as uh, a, a, a savior who wanted to give them something else. And um, so we must always be aware and conscious of the fact that this is 
God that we are, you know, dealing with on a daily basis, that we are interacting with on a daily basis. He is God, uh, and uh, He has His own plans, His own purposes. Uh, we must be willing to accept whatever He is giving from His hand, uh, rather than make our own demands and say, "No, this is how I want you to work in my life. This is the way I want you to provide." Uh, the Lord always knows better, and we would probably have to submit to Him. Let Him be the Messiah that he wishes to be in our lives, you know. Um, he will want to save in a particular way. He will want to provide in a particular way. He will guide and direct us to do certain things uh, according to his will. Let him be what he wants to be in our lives because uh, that is submission. So submission basically would be uh, when he is doing certain things that are not really in line with what we would want. We would still uh, very trustingly submit and say, Lord, I know that there is good in this. Uh, you are permitting this uh, uh, with your own greater plans in mind. And uh, so we, we would need to have that attitude of trust. Um, yeah, so maybe that's one uh, takeaway that we can, you know, uh, draw from this. And now we will, uh, you know, very quickly move into the other passage, uh, which talks about Jesus who comes to them on the uh, water. Uh, if we could maybe read out verses 16, 17, 18, and 19. Yeah, 16 to 19. If someone could read out, please. Can I read, Martha? Yes. When, when Jesus came, when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea got into a boat and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near to the boat and they were frightened. Okay. Um, uh the winds have now picked up and uh, because of that the waters are getting churned so the whole um, uh, situation is kind of serious because uh, this probably is a smaller boat and would not have the stability required to be able to handle waters which are like uh, churning to that level and uh, so in the midst of that uh, they see something walking on the water so which is why they assume that it probably is some kind of a spirit or a ghost and they are very afraid and then immediately after that jesus speaks to them and uh, in verses 20 and 21 and he says it is i so do not be afraid and uh, then they are willing to uh, you know take him into the boat and uh, then we have this very interesting verse uh, so maybe if we could read out verses 20 and 21 i'll read Yes. Don't be afraid. I'll read. Don't be afraid. Jesus told them, it is I. Then they willingly took him into the boat and they immedi and immediately the boat reached land at the place where they were heading for. Thank you. Yes. So uh, here Jesus deals with this particular storm in a way that is different from the previous storm you know i mean I, the other story if we remember uh, there jesus speaks to the winds and the waves and asks them to be still and they obey him here he does not speak to the winds or the waves here something else happens in one or uh, one moment they are out there in the middle of the waters and in the next moment they are at the land uh, so they're literally like you know using star trek terminology they're beamed up from there and uh, you know they beam down to the shore in a ends. So we see Jesus dealing with a impossible uh, situation in one particular way on one occasion, and on the other occasion, this current occasion, he deals with it in a completely different way. So the one thing that maybe we can remember uh, when we are in a, in the middle of a really impossible situation is. For us, it looks impossible. There's, there isn't even one way of dealing with it. But God who is looking at it has multiple options to work through. You know, 
he is beyond us his power is uh, you know uh, infinite his wisdom is infinite so when he looks at our impossibility he is not looking at you know maybe he's not struggling to come up with one option of you know getting us out of that uh, situation he has got multiple choices lined up so what looks so impossible to us where not even one option is showing up uh, to him uh, you know, because of his uh, uh, infinite ability, uh, to him, the options are multiple. So what seems impossible to us need not frighten us, uh, because for him, uh, there are multiple options open on dealing with the situation that we are in. So um, I think all these things were placed here in scripture uh, for us to trust him, for us to learn something about his character, uh, for us to learn uh, more about his ability um, so that we can have this assurance, this deep assurance that uh, we will be taken care of. Because only when we absorb these things into our heart and we start applying them uh, to our own lives, then we can talk about these things to others and say, hey, you know, I was in this impossibility and this is how God took care of me. This is what he revealed about himself in that situation. So you can also trust him in the same manner. So uh, what we have learned, not just from scripture, but through our own personal experiences, we will then be able to share with uh, others. So I think all of these things are learnings that we, um, the Lord wants us to absorb into our spirit, you know, even as we meditate on these passages. Um, so now we are moving into the passage which talks about Jesus as the bread of life. Uh, so um, if we, maybe we could read out verses 25, 26, 27. Yes, those three verses, please. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Yes. So um, they asked the question, uh, there was no other boat. So how did you get across? You know, they're curious about that. Uh, they know that the disciples left without Jesus. And now here he is. So uh, they raised that question. Jesus does not even answer that question. He addresses the other issue. He says, you people are following me not because you really care about what I have to offer. You only want material benefits. Uh, so... Um, he points out this thing, you know, this lack which is there in their hearts, the wrong motive which is there in their hearts. Uh, and uh, so then they ask him and say, uh, what must we do to do the works God requires? So if we could maybe read out verses 28 and 29, please. Verse 28. Yes. So they asked him, what can we do in order to do what God wants us to do. Jesus answered, What God wants you to do is to believe in the one who sent, who he sent. Yes. So, um, in verse 27, you know, Jesus says, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life. So you, your, your, you people have set your uh, eyes on limited, uh, you know, uh, material things. But there's something greater. There are things of far greater value. So set your eyes on those things and work towards those things. So which is why they ask him, okay, if those are the kind of works that we should do, exactly what does that mean? How what what kind of works are we supposed to do? And uh, Jesus does not immediately go and give a long list of things that they should do. Rather, he says the first work that you should be doing is to believe in the one who sent. Uh, you know, the one that, that God has sent. So over here, uh, Jesus is placing belief, uh, trust, faith. He's placing that even before any actions that, you know, that we would start doing later. So the first step 
the main work which god wants us believers to do is this to have a complete total trust in the lord because out of that trust will come obedience you know because we trust him so much now we will be willing to submit and obey even when he asks us difficult things so out of that trust and faith will come the uh, you know uh, the mirac the miraculous extraordinary things that we will achieve you know in our personal lives in our ministry in helping people uh, out of that faith and trust which we have built out of that uh, will come the you know the prayers of power where we would um, you know uh, claim the scriptures and stand in faith and know that those things will really be accomplished for us so all of these things actually emerge out of that faith that trust relationship which we have built out so even before we do anything else the very first work that god wants each believer to be doing is this establish that trust relationship build up that personal trust relationship and uh, uh, that only happens with time in the sense the more time we spend with him uh, you know uh, digging into the scriptures meditating on his word allowing him to just uh, speak into our hearts and minister to us and build up our inner man because that is where the faith gets built right in our inner man not just in our mind which can reason and think and you know uh, logically come to conclusions that is good we need the mind uh, but uh, the inner man is where the actual faith building process takes place so we need to create time uh, where the lord can speak into our into our lives from his scriptures so uh, that is for something very important as we spend more time with him and start getting to know him even as he starts opening up all these scriptures to us that faith gets built that relationship gets established and then out of that relationship will come all the other works so the first work for any of us would be to build up our uh, a strong faith relationship with him where we just trust him a lot uh, now uh, even, even as i am saying these words uh, you know i'm just thinking in my mind i have not reached there uh, because uh, i'm still in the learning process and we all are still in the learning process but day by day uh, the amount that we trust him should go on increasing because the more we are secure in him and we just trust him completely the more we will obey the more we will do mighty works the more we will be strong in our prayers the more we will be able to go out and help people uh, so the first work something very important for us to remember the very first work that god requires of us is to build our faith relationship with god to believe in him uh, completely and totally uh, moving on very quickly to the next uh, few verses uh, maybe we could if we could have someone read out verses 30 to 35 please therefore they said to him what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you what work will you do our father ate the manna in the desert as it is written he gave them bread from heaven to eat then jesus said to them most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they say to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. So um, here the people are uh, still very, you know, set upon getting their bread supply. And so they ask him, what sign then will you give uh, that we may believe in you? And in fact, they go further and they say, you see, uh, we were given bread from heaven in uh, the Old Testament. Uh, so now something along those lines, you know, it would be in order. You should also be starting to provide us, you know, bread in miraculous ways. Continue to do that for us. So they're continuing to manipulate him and try to pressurize him into being this uh, Santa Claus who will be, you know, taking care of all their material needs. And uh, uh, then Jesus says, he says, um, uh, for the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And uh, so he says, I am that bread of life in verse 35. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. So um, 
Jesus is trying to shift their focus from off material things onto him. Uh, so he says, um, you know, you're again and again going on focusing on your material needs. Those will be taken care of. But you should be focusing more on your spiritual needs because he says, I have come over here primarily not just to provide material things, but to give life to the world. Uh, he says, whoever comes to me uh, will never go hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So all their spiritual needs will be met. All the needs which you know they have for eternity, um, uh, to prepare themselves for eternity, those needs can be taken care of by me. Uh, because uh, bread and these material things are something that can maybe provide us with comfort and sustenance for um, let us say the next 90 years or 100 years, depending on however long we live. Uh, but what after that? Uh, there are things that you're going to be needing for the rest of the thousands of years that are yet you're going to be alive. Uh, so Jesus is saying, look, I can take care of your physical needs, which you know, which are which are required for you for this particular age uh, while you're on this earth. But what about eternity when you're still going to be alive? I mean, you're, you're not going to cease to exist. You'll continue to exist. You'll continue to be there. And um, so I can provide you with things that you require to prepare yourself for all of those thousands of years, which you will still be spending, you know, and uh, you would need to be prepared for that. And I can prepare you for that. I can provide you what you need. You will never be hungry. You will never be thirsty. You will never lack. I can take care of your next 10,000 years. So uh, most of us, uh, tend to get into this trap where we are only making preparations for the next 90 years, for the next 100 years. But what about the you know, the 10,000 years which are going to come after that? What preparations are we doing for that? Because that's a much longer period of time. In fact, that's an infinite period of time. And what preparations are we making for that? This Jesus, this Lord, he is promising that he can provide us and um, uh, with what we need and prepare us for those thousands of years, not just for these 90 or 100 years, but also for all of eternity. Uh, the preparation for that would have to be done now. So Jesus is trying very hard to, uh, to prepare them for that. And so he continues to speak along those lines in the next few verses. Um, so if someone could just quickly read out that, uh, verses 36 to 40. Let's see what Jesus says over here. 36 to 40, please. But I say to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe me. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me I shall lose nothing but should raise it up at the last day and this is the will of him who sent me that everyone who sees the son and believes in him may have everlasting life and i will raise him up at the last day okay so jesus is talking about future things eternal things um uh, so he says you see, if you people believe in me and uh, you, you're willing to submit to me, then I can keep you safe. He says, uh, this is the uh, in, in verse, uh, he says in verse 37, whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. And then in verse 39, he says, this is the will of him who sent me. What is God's will? That I shall lose none of all those he has given me. But I will raise them up at the last day, he says. Uh, and what is he raising them up for? In verse 40, he says, so that you know they will have eternal life. And again, he repeats, he says, I will raise them up at the last day. Uh, they will be safe in me. Everyone who trusts and uh, submits to me, to my lordship, I will keep them secure. I will keep them safe until the last day. And on that last day, I will raise them up once again. So which means, you know, even though the word last day is being used over here, it is the last day of this phase of what we know. And there's another entirely new phase that is going to begin, a new phase of existence that's going to begin. So he says, on that last day of this phase, I will raise them up for new things, an entirely new um, chapter of their lives. 
and they would be walking into things that we do, we don't yet know about so god is not i think many of us believers are not very excited about the future because we don't really know what is there in that eternal future and um, it doesn't really help that we have all these silly images which you know are uh, portrayed by the secular world about people sitting on clouds and playing harps and how <laughs> pointless i mean after creating us and giving us this life that we have on this earth where we are uh, engaged in so many activities and our mind absorbs so much and uh, you know uses uh, our mind is used for so many different things and we are put uh, on this earth with all these talents and we have this very busy lavish uh, extensive life you think at the end of it all uh, you know as we go into the next phase the lord would just say sit on a harp and uh, you know have this uh, halo kind of floating over your head and sit over there and play a harp how ridiculous is that he has something equally exciting or something even more exciting and even grander for the next phase the next chapter and uh, uh, so there are um, amazing things awaiting us in the future this 90 100 years are just years of preparation so jesus is saying submit to me place your trust in me um, be willing to listen to my word and hear me because i am the prophet who has come and moses said you shall hear him when he comes you must hear him so do that so that on that last day last day of this current phase once that is done i will raise up these people who have made a commitment to him and i will lead them into a whole new chapter which is still very top secret it has not been revealed to us the details of what though that would involve but we are all going to be walking into greater things amazing things so uh, uh, now is the time for us to build our relationship of trust with this jesus to really get to know him to really learn how to submit to him because i think all of these lessons that we are learning now will somehow have some kind of implications in that new chapter uh, because you know now he's establishing the strong relationship and i think that will carry over and really uh, help us in this next uh, thing that he has lined up for us in the in our eternal future so the humans uh, in this passage are focusing on very limited little material things and jesus on the other hand is looking into the very distant future into the millions of years which are there ahead and he's talking about eternal things and he's trying to convey those things to these uh, very small minded people and is not giving any details he's just saying trust in me start to step 1 step 1 the work that god requires of you right now is trust in me follow me live for me you know lift up your cross and carry it each day for me because you're all getting uh, prepared for that last day of this current phase when i will raise you up for a whole new um, you know uh, era in your lives so uh, these are the some of the things that god is trying to convey in uh, this passage um and he makes it very very clear in verse 44 he says no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws them and he assures that whoever is willing to respond whoever is has a submissive heart whoever has a heart that wants to believe in him and trust him he says that um they will be part of his kingdom because um he says no um, everyone who has heard the father and learned from him comes to me and he says i will receive them Okay, so these are just some things that we could cover in uh, our first session. So we will now go for a break, and we will come back at nine fifty. All right. So uh, we'll continue chapter six, and then we'll start off chapter seven. All right. Thank you so much.